Well, welcome. We do try to get these going on time so that people can work their schedules, uh, stick to their schedules. Um, I'm Ralph Townsend. For those of you who perhaps haven't been here before, I'm the director of ICER. It's a real pleasure today to introduce Gordon Gislason. Gordon is someone I have known for 20 some years would be my guess, something like that. Uh, Gordon, um, my background is as a fisheries economist and I have known Gordon for the work he has done, particularly in uh, British Columbia where he's from, but more broadly related to fisheries around the world. Uh, Gordon has been an independent consultant doing work primarily in fisheries, although not exclusively in fisheries. Uh, as an independent consultant, he's been working for about 35 years. He's done a couple hundred studies uh, related to fisheries, uh, fisheries and aquaculture. And today he's here to make a presentation on what's an issue for uh, really fisheries around the world, and that is commercial versus recreational fisheries allocation. And I believe this is a piece of work that was actually done in relation to a, a, a government initiative to actually try to make the, the difficult decisions around allocating commercial and, and recreational fisheries. So Gordon, it's a pleasure to have you here, and let me turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for, uh, for being here. Um, and talk about a subject uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, and talk about the economic component of the allocation. But I'm also going to talk about the need for allocation and the process for allocation and what, if any, role economics has in that. Because uh, the reality can be quite different than the uh, textbook um, argument. Um, so why do we need allocation? Did we have an allocation a hundred years ago? Did we need allocation? Allocation is driven by resource sca uh, scarcity and, and conflicts. When you come up against a, a TAC, people fight for their share of the TAC. It doesn't matter whether it's within the commercial sector or commercial versus rec or uh, more broad based. We have competing uses of and uh, uses, and as we shall <coughs> see uh, later on, the concept of value uh, differs quite dramatically between commercial and recreational. In Canada, we're fond, if that's the right word, of saying fisheries management <laughs> is an art, and it's art of. Uh, balancing competing interests on a three-legged stool. So there's the environment or sus sustainability, there's business and economic, and there's social. And I, I, I treat jobs under the social banner and not under the economic banner, which uh, is uh, in some uh, dispute or people have different views on that. So let's look at each of these three uh, pegs and see what the arguments are for, for allocation. If you look at FAO and what, what does sustainability mean, they have three tests in their uh, uh, 1995 document. You have to limit the harvest of target species, limit harvest and impacts on non-target species and habitats, and also you, you need an efficient fisheries management regime. So the word limit harvest in the first two bullets uh, aligns strongly with the need for allocation. We go to the economic peg. There's a major conference in Australia in uh, 2006. Uh, I presented a couple papers there on allocation. Uh, Peter Pierce, a uh, well-known economist, gave a keynote address. But what I took away from that was that he said, for efficiency and uh, resource management, you need initial secure allocations and you need to be able to trade those allocations. If you go back to textbook economics, as I believe, the word allocation is part and parcel of the definition of economics. In terms of social issues, I've talked about a lot of conflict. People will fight to the death over 
property rights and allocation. It really doesn't, um, I mean, to the death is an extreme, but people feel passionately about that. Uh, in, in fact, the whole drive for statehood in Alaska was, in, in my reading, was getting control over their natural resource base, specifically the salmon fisheries. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, conflict over uh, eminent domain issues in Connecticut and elsewhere over the last few decades. So property rights are something that people feel passionately about and people are willing to fight for. Once property rights, once settled, can pro uh, offer uh, certainty to business and, and, uh, and jobs. And it can also improve the fisheries management system. Um, I've uh, given several presentations to fisheries man management councils uh, across the U.S., uh, Pacific Fisheries Management Council uh, meeting in California, Gulf of Mexico uh, meeting in Florida on this allocation issue. And I've collated um, certain comments that I've received that um, um, give the fishery management view on the importance of allocation. And they're presented here. Now the one that I particularly like <laughs> resonates with me is the number four. Every council decision is an allocation decision. It's not labeled as such, but every decision affects allocation, affects the take by one particular interest group versus another group. And also, if you look at uh, item eight, um, from a pragmatic point of view, people are trying to minimize the complaints. Well, let's move to the second part, economics. Let's presuppose that economics has something to say for about the allocation issue. We'll get back to that in a minute. But commercial and recreational are very different sectors. The allocation in the commercial versus recreational context is completely different than, say, within the commercial sector where you're talking about mobile gear versus fixed gear because you're talking about uh, the same product if you're talking about within the commercial sector. You're talking about different products when you're talking about commercial versus recreation. Economists have at least two different ways of looking at, thing, at the world. One is in terms of values and the other one is in terms of economic impact. But one thing I think before we people get into the deep end of the pool of doing economic analysis, they have to ask the question, what is the product that we're looking at? And who are the producers and consumers of that product? Because they, that drives the economic analysis. I mentioned commercial and recreational are, are different, completely different. The product on the commercial side is the fish product on the recreational side is the angling experience. So it's more than the fish. It's the aesthetics. People can enjoy the angling experience even though they didn't catch any fish. They can value the angling experience even though they throw away or release the fish that they do catch. So it's not a consumption oriented activity on the recreational side where it is on the commercial side. And this is reflected in the output measure. Output measure on, on commercial fishery is quantity of fish. The measure used in the recreational fishery is angler days, recreation days. Then who are the producing sectors? On the commercial side, you have fishermen who draw the fish out of the water, processors who, who produce it, and, and, and slice and dice it into a consumer product. And then there's the whole distribution sector. On the recreational fishery, so on the commercial side, all those entities actually handle the fish. Who's the producers on the, on the recreational side? 
where there are charters and lodges who actually package a fishing product for consumption by, by the angler. But there is also the angler himself. Economists have come up with this brilliant uh, uh, idea of the household production function. So the angler produces the product and sells it to himself at the transaction cost, the cost of, of uh, creating the experience. So the producing sector on the recreational side, in my view, is the for hire business who basically take guides or take out anglers and the private angler himself. And who are the, <coughs> excuse me, who are the consumers? So there's consumers in uh, retail stores, there's consumers in uh, food service, which is the fancy name for restaurants, um, and then there's the anger as the consumer. And one thing I, I would say is uh, a lot of analyses that I've seen in terms of comparing commercial and recreational um, stop at the processed product level on the commercial side. My view is that it should go right to the retail level because anger expenditures are retail expenditures. So if we want to compare these two sectors on equal footing, we should include the uh, uh, retail margins um, that on, uh, on, uh, on seafood products. So we have economic value versus economic impact analysis. Economic value looks at surpluses gained by producers and consumers. Consumers can earn a surplus, i.e. if I go and spend $50 for a sweater and I'm really willing to pay $60, I gain a, a surplus of $10 from that because I'm paying less than I actually was willing to pay. Similarly, on the anger side, Lots of uh, willingness to pay surveys, uh, contingent valuation surveys, have demonstrated that anglers are willing to spend 30, 50, 80 dollars more than the actual cost of fishing. So that's the surplus on the um, on the recreational side. In in contrast, and so that's a that's a, and then there's profits to uh, producers. Um, and profits to wage earners. Um, if, for example, the going uh, rate of return in business is 10% and somebody in fishing is making 15%, the 5% difference between those in terms of rate of return is, a, is an economic profit. If somebody's making $25 an hour going fishing and their opportunity cost or alternative uh, best job income is only $15, they're making $10 an hour on the economic value account. Um, whereas on the uh, economic impact account, it would uh, consider the full $25 on the wage, the full 15% dollar, dollar return on the, uh, on the business side. Um, economic value analysis uh, typically re restricts itself to direct producers and consumers. So it doesn't include any profits earned by, by uh, fuel companies or whatever indirect effects. Whereas economic impact analysis follows these expenditures all the way through the economy. So it includes indirect supplier effects and also money that wage earners spend on, uh, on food and clothing and, uh, and housing and so on. So one of the key differences is not is the treatment of non-market benefits and costs as indicated in the surpluses. The surpluses may be a financial surplus or it may be just an intangible surplus. Those are considered in the economic value analysis but not in the economic impact analysis. Economic impact analysis follows the money and nothing else. One thing too is it, it's important to look at which region uh, uh, either the value or the impact analysis um, refers to. Um, and sometimes this isn't explicitly stated in, in various analyses. For example, 
uh, on the anger side, if you're looking at this from a Alaska point of view, Alaska, you know, people of Alaska point of view, if somebody from uh, Texas comes up here and goes salmon fishing, has a great time, and was willing to spend $100 a day more than they actually did spend, that's irrelevant to an Alaska value analysis. If we were doing it from the U.S. point of view, that would be relevant. Similarly, on the uh, economic impact side, if, uh, if, say, on the indirect and, and uh, induced uh, consumer spending impact, some of those impacts that occur in Washington State or New York City or the, you know, the product is sold in a, a restaurant in Chicago, creates income and employment there, that is relevant to a U.S. study, but not to an Alaska only study. So um, I guess my view is that you should be explicit about um, uh, which regions you're talking about because the, uh, the impacts and the values can be quite different depending on, on the region. Okay, so the top part of this uh, slide tries to summarize what I, I just said. So economic value re restricts itself to consumers and producers, and economic impacts looks at uh, direct industry, indirect supplier, and consumer and spending effects, money effects. Now the economist, how do you choose between these two things in terms of looking at, say, allocation? Economists um, seem to value that economic value is the best measure in looking at the allocation question because it looks at, at things on a net, not a gross <coughs> basis. It, it subtracts off the opportunity cost of people's alternative wage, uh, wage employment, uh, uh, alternative business opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. And it also includes uh, non-market values and benefits. People, just because it, it uh, doesn't go through the marketplace doesn't mean it doesn't have a value. Otherwise, you would say uh, human life doesn't have a value because there's no marketplace for human life. Long allocation, there's also the short run versus the long run in terms of economic impacts, repercussions, values, whatever you want to call it. Allocation is uh, a change from the status quo, uh, and, and in my view, a long-run perspective is, is, is better than a short-run perspective. In theory, it, it is, it is uh, permanent, although uh, I can show you a case, case study from British Columbia in, in which it wasn't. And in terms of, should we be looking at average values versus marginal values? When we're looking at allocation, we're moving fish around at the margin from one sector to the other. And so, you know, in my view, we should be looking at the marginal, long run marginal economic value um, of an extra fish to each of these sectors. And that's the relevant economic measure um, actually almost 20 years ago to the day that I, I, I completed some work um, in British Columbia, Canada, looking at um, economic value and impacts of uh, Chinook and coho salmon. And this is um, uh, a very information intensive exercise. Um, these outline some of the types of data that we had to uh, use. There was some professional judgment involved. There were some benefit transfer techniques using literature, uh, 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 information from the literature. So it's not easy doing this. And um, at the end of the day, we painted a picture of what the commercial recreational fishery, fisheries looked like 
and then um, build a so-called simulation model where we would shock it by say 10% if we had 10% more fish with a mix of one sector or the other. Now on the commercial side, it's much easier because if you add 10% more fish and you assume there's a competitive marketplace where it doesn't affect the price, then 10% more fish and the, and the commercial fishery has the catching power to actually catch that fish. Uh, that means the revenue base of all these entities in the value chain go up by 10%. On the recreational side, it's much more complicated. Um, if you add 10% more fish, you're not going to get necessarily 10% more angler days. Um, uh, as fish is only one part of the experience, you're not adding 10% to the total experience, you're only adding 10% to the fish part of the experience. Um, also, even if, uh, uh, and so we had to use some, uh, some information from the literature and some professional judgment in terms of doing this. Now here's the picture that we painted in terms of the Chinook uh, salmon fishery. Uh, commercial versus recreational. So we have activity managers catch, save fish, expenditures, economic impacts, and economic values. Um, you notice that on the expenditure side, we did add something on retail margin. This was done for the uh, for the province of British Columbia. Uh, where perhaps only 15% of the uh, of the salmon is, is, is consumed there. The rest goes to other provinces in Canada or to export outside Canada. If we had done this for a Canadian perspective, that 3.6 million would have increased. <coughs> um, if you look at the ec economic value components, uh, under the existing situation, uh, fishermen and processors did earn returns above their opportunity costs. Workers also we compared the wages to uh, you know the average wages in the province, and uh, so the workers <coughs> did get a. I mean the crew members on boats, the people working in processing plants, did get payments above what their opportunity costs were. Um, the negative number on government revenues is uh, reflects um, an unemployment insurance scheme that's very friendly to fishermen. In fact, it's only available to fishermen. Uh, if they work so many weeks in a year, they can draw on uh, unemployment. There's no needs program, so you could make a million dollars or a thousand dollars. And if you look at the, uh, the accounting of the program, uh, for every dollar that fishermen put in, uh, they take out six dollars. So there's not many uh, self-sustaining uh, insurance programs like that. So I treated that as a subsidy. Uh, there's been various trade wars between Canada and the U.S. Mm -hmm. on softwood lumber and other things. And uh, I've learned that uh, the lawyers have a different definition of, of, of subsidy than, say, economists. But anyway, from my view, this is an economic view economists, uh, lawyers don't treat the unemployment insurance program in Canada as a subsidy. Uh, in my view, that's debatable, but I'm outside Canada, so I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look at the, that graph, the numbers look overwhelming in favor of recreational. They have much larger numbers on expenditures and economic values and impacts with, with, which is with a smaller take of Chinook. So my view, yes, but don't misuse this information. Because the recreational side involves more than the fish, um, don't be tempted to take those values and divide through by the number of fish and call that the average value of a fish. Because you're talking about, on the recreational side, the values, the impacts, the expenditures come from more than the fish. Uh, 
I don't know if this is a good analogy or not, but if you were looking at, say, a citrus farmer from Florida who grew both oranges and grapefruits and took the total revenue base from both those products and divided through by the number of oranges alone and said that's the average value of an orange, uh, people might have some problem with the, with the math on that. In my view, this is an equivalent. The other thing that's different, and just to go, I'll go back and forth here, if you go back on to the commercial side, regardless of what the numbers are, in terms of the mix on the economic value side, most of the, the so-called values on the commercial side are to business and workers. So those are tangible numbers, tangible dollars that you can spend. And they come and they're accrued to a narrow group, i.e. the participants in the industry. If you look at the recreational side, most of the so-called values or benefits occur as consumer satisfaction benefits from angling and from the government through the sales taxes on, uh, on angler and purchases. So a couple things. One is the consumer surplus, that's, you know, happiness dollars but you can't spend them. And the government revenues go to the broad base, not to the actual participants. So there's a, you know, a couple issues here. Should you know, concrete dollars that you can spend be valued the same as, as happiness dollars that you can't spend? And economists tend to say yes. Uh, politicians and policy makers uh, may have a different view on that. They're worried about balance of budgets and other things. So the recreational benefits are more broad-based and less tangible than the commercial benefits. So not only are we talking about different products and, and different perspectives on these two sectors, in terms of their economic values or whatever, they're quite different as well. So that's what we're talking about, painting a picture of the situation as it is. So the previous slide talked about long run marginal economic value is the way to go if you're looking at allocations in an economic perspective. Looking at the, at the fishery as a whole, it was a slam dunk in terms of recreation. If we look at the marginal value of fish, and we have to define what a fish is. <laughs> is that a fish kept? Is that a fish kept and retained? Do we take into account bycatch and fish uh, killed during bycatch. So this slide shows three different definitions of fish. Uh, retained, caught, and killed. And uh, with this sustainability test, there's a lot more interest in bycatch today than there was in, in years past. And a lot of people want uh, bycatch considered a fisheries management. And in fact, there are bycatch ITQs in, in British Columbia and, el and elsewhere. So you can see that these numbers are much closer together uh, than commercial and recreational. And regardless of what the numbers say, commercial and recreational are never going to agree on, on anything, okay? Uh, it's amazing during the course of the study, uh, we heard such novel arguments that commercial guys would say things like, we were here first, uh, therefore we deserve all the fish. or Recreation is a pleasure activity and, there, it, and therefore it has no value. Um, the recreational guy, uh, or they would say, uh, people who didn't go fish, uh, recreational fishing, they go golfing, so they don't add anything to the economy. The recreational in, uh, guys, in turn, had their own mantra of, uh, of uh, complaints. You know, the commercial industry is, is, uh, is uh, completely subsidized. Uh, you know, we pay a lot of sales taxes and the commercial fishery doesn't, and things like that. So regardless of each of these merit, each of these arguments has any merit or not, th there's a great divide between them. And actually, economics is not gonna close that divide. So what happened with this analysis? Um, I can't really say that uh, 
it was on the direct path to the so-called decision, but it was cited. <laughs> um, and so the economic allocation policy was recreational gets priority access to Chinook and Coho, um, and commercial gets guaranteed at least 95% of the sockeye pink and shell. So this was the allocation policy for salmon overall. Um, the recreational sector uh, treated this publicly as a huge win. They developed promotional activity, marketing activity. For the first time, the government has realized that we are the most beneficial use of the resorts and given us priority access. And stuff. Uh, anyway, this went on for years. Um, neither side really got what they wanted. <laughs> Um, I guess maybe that's good policy. I don't know. Uh, the policy hasn't hasn't really been uncontentious, although you know the definition of priority access. What does that mean? In theory, what that meant was the commercial Chinook salmon fleet was supposed to be tied to the dock uh, until the recreational sector was at quote unquote full limits. And so, what does full limits mean? And at this time, we were going through a, well, there was a Chinook crisis in 96, a Coho crisis in 98. Uh, but, but anyway, the recreational sector uh, interpreted that as full, you know, uh, uh, four possession and two dating, you know, coastwide, whereas uh, in practice, it's only been in certain regions of the coast where the, the so-called full limits have been in practice, but the commercial fleet is allowed to be to fish uh, Chinook. But generally, I must admit, the policy has been uncontentious. And it hasn't really been revised. Um, it's um, perhaps been overtaken by other events. The, the wet wild salmon policy that came out in 2005 and, and other things. So. OK, so that's economics. Did some economics. The government came to a decision. Um, but stepping back, what is good allocation practice? Now, and I'll, I'll come to that in the next slide. But if you look at experience around the world, economics doesn't have a lot to do with, <laughs> with allocation. It's grandfathering of existing users. It's the way the world works. It's the way the world works in terms of within the commercial sector, in terms of grandfathering, uh, say, uh, initial permit holders for Halibut, or you know, in terms of ITQ programs. Um, it's the way the world works outside of the commercial fishery. Taxi cab licenses in Boston, New York, LA are, were issued in the late 30s for the first time to, lo and behold, existing taxi cab. <laughs> uh, businesses, okay. Uh, the U.S. Homestead Act of 1862 gave a quarter section of land, 160 acres, to people working the land. Uh, mineral rights are, have been uh, allocated based on staking and claim, first uses. So that's the way the world works. But in terms of allocation in, in practice, what are the goals of allocation? What is the allocation currency? Are we talking about fish kept or fish killed? If we're talking about fish killed, how do we measure fish killed? Because the what's the release portion of that? So that there's catch monitoring um, uh, issues. One thing that's interesting, and this was found in both uh, British Columbia and in Western Austra Australia, uh, for scale fish in British Columbia for halibut, is okay. Well, we'll put in a number, we'll divide. Here's two numbers they add to 100%. The numbers were basically grandfathered to existing reported catches. Oh, we need to put in more stringent catch monitoring to ensure that people are playing by the rules. <coughs> Almost immediately in both British Columbia and Western Australia, when you do this on the recreational side, the catches jump. Is it because people are fishing more because of uh, uh, the allocation program, or is it just that the existing rec record that we used to grandfather uh, entitlements were underreported? 
I have my own view of that. Um, so catch monitoring is important. And the allocation scorecard in terms of Western Australia, which I was, I was through to review some other work there. Um, the recreational sector always makes the point that, you know, we can't pinpoint our catch from day one of the, of the, of the year. Uh, we need some flexibility. So what Australia has done is, is uh, they've said, well, here are our targets, but we expect them to meet them over five years. So you could, in theory, be over one year and under the next year and still meet the so-called allocation target. So you may need something <coughs> creative on the recreational side, whereas you know, the commercial side, they, they can catch the last fish to their allocation because they have the catching power. One of the issues in, in uh, allocation is, is this permanent or is this, you know, you know, this is just a starting point. We can continue fighting with each other for, for increments at each other's expense. And if you are going to have reallocation, who's going to do it? Is it going to be government? Or is it going to be buyer-seller between the two sectors? There's individual business interests on the commercial side, but on the recreational side, is there a legal entity that can, that can actually buy or sell their allocation? Um, and one of the issues is on the government side is, you know, if the government is going to decide or do the reallocation, is it reallocate, reallocation with a compensation or not compensation? In British Columbia, um, the initial um, ruling was 12% 12, 12 uh, recreational, 88% uh, um, commercial. But uh, several years later, the government uh, upped the, the recreational share to 15%, but they didn't compensate the, the commercial side. It all went all the way to a court case. And uh, basically, uh, the courts ruled that the government of Canada, through the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans, can do whatever he wants. <laughs> uh, uh, he is the sole power, and moreover, uh, from our Constitution of 1867, but moreover, he doesn't actually even have to give a reason. He, uh, he could just decide without a reason. And as you can see, uh, that practice violates one of my principles. So in terms of looking at allocation in British Columbia and elsewhere in the world, um, I've come up with rules, <laughs> what I would call good allocation practice. And you can't just sit in a corner and make an allocation decision. You have to talk to the interested parties. You can't just sit in the corner and make up an allocation decision that's inconsistent with policy and, and statutes. It also, I think, has to pass the red face test, i.e. it has to be just and reasonable to a fair number of people, including people who have nothing to do with, with fisheries. How do you sell this to the public at, at home? And here we come to grandfathering again. Um, there may be good reasons that you may want to disrupt the, the status quo, uh, but they should be articulated, <laughs> and people should be accountable for those reasons. And finally, uh, you know, the decision-making process should be transparent in my view, and, and this is where the Albert example in BC failed, and this goes back to the, to the legal framework for fisheries in, 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 in Canada. Okay, so what can we learn from all this? Well, I guess in my view, there's a compelling need for allocation, uh, both on the environmental, economic, and social grounds. It produces so-called benefits under all three legs supporting the fisheries manage management still. Allocation is also contentious. Different products, different perspectives. You know, each side doesn't want to be confused by the facts, so to speak. Okay, yeah, you know. Consensus is not possible. We need leadership. 
it's not like, well, we we'll let the sporties and the commercial guys in a room and they'll come up with a solution and then we're going to just hand it. That's not going to happen. And I hate to say this, but what is, you know, or answer this question, what's the role of economics and economists in, in this fisheries al allocation policy scheme? We went through this whole rigorous analysis that I outlined there. Um, at the end of the day, a decision was made. Nobody's ever tapped me on the shoulder saying, well, we, we, you should revisit this, or you should do this for another species, or, or whatever. It, it's economics, it's, it, the grandfathering issue is so overwhelming, not only in fisheries, but how this is how society works, good or bad. You may not agree with it. The only exclusion is, uh, I think, Gary Lovercap, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but has made the point that on new valuable so-called unexploited resources like broadband spectrum and, and things like that, that auctions and things do make sense. But where there are existing users and existing interests, uh, grandfathering is and first possession rules are going to uh, dominate. Now, does that say the same thing about economists? And I would say not necessarily. I think economists have a lot to say in the allocation issue, but not necessarily about the economics of fisheries. You know, a good economist is broad-based and knows things about agriculture and other things, and I brought some of my discussion of taxi cab licenses and, and, uh, and set in the West and whatever, that, you know, if, we, if economists can draw some of this experience in from other areas, that uh, they have a, have a role to play in the allocation issue, as opposed to strict economic analysis. And um, I know I have a, you can go both ways too. I had an experience where um, uh, there's something called uh, uh, supply management in Canada and agriculture, certain commodities, dairy, eggs, and chicken are, are there's a set, uh, set um, production level set by a, a council in, uh, in Ottawa, and then it's divvied up between the provinces. And lo and behold, there was a d dispute amongst the provinces how the chicken quota should be. <laughs> well, actually, the increase in the chicken quota, because some provinces were increasing population, some provinces were decreasing. But anyway, those so-called five rules, I just made a presentation to them and, and said, well, these are based on tradition, <coughs> but I think they apply to any allegation dispute. And uh, I'm not sure what uh, the cause and effect was, but at the end of the day, there was uh, a settlement. So. You know, I'm more optimistic about, optimistic about the role of economists uh, in allocation uh, issues than the role of pure economics. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take any questions or whatever. Is that Matt? Yeah, hi. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while, yeah. Yeah. That was the doc, that was so we were you, you're analysis. doing your study, yeah. And, and the difference between your results and the story you tell about the BC shrimp fishing and, and the uh, you know, stockpile the three of the Georgia Strikers, uh, we had a very different experience. And, and because of that, I'm not sure that our experience with BC shrimp fisheries is going to be bad. Uh, and one of the, I don't know why the difference. First of all, we're dealing with sockeye, which, as you know, is a very size size in BC, primarily the commercial fishery, but not. Yeah, BC. yeah. And secondly, uh, we, rather than do uh, sort of just experts in literature reviews, we're looking at well, what's the effect of a the marginal value of additional fish. We try to estimate that correctly. And the reason is because the allocation rules were directly tied. To measure how people cared about these things, things like bagging them. And it, and, and it was, you know, there was, it was, it was uh, quite elastic, in other words. <laughs> it really, the angler days really did, uh, you know, people did 
But wasn't the Tango Day that you actually mentioned the September 3rd bus trip where he did respond to the Steve Grimes bus trip? So, uh, you know, looking at your sample and also our, our report from our form, we, we did a different estimation. We didn't just estimate reduced research bus and the conventional way, which uh, we actually wanted to look at reduced research bus from the standpoint of the participants in the pit crew, which makes it much closer to the way that we are out actually measuring consumer search bus based on uh, revealed preference. You're talking about and skipper satisfaction yeah, bonus well and stuff? We actually measured Yeah, 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 well, uh, yeah, well, I think there's, uh, I forget, there was somebody in the 1980s who, who, in Alaska who did several papers or research papers on this. Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, I mean, the, the studies were published in, uh, yeah. in the 1990s. So. Yeah, but I guess the, the issue is, well, or one of the issues is, I've heard rumors that a wide variety of people uh, enjoy their jobs, even the odd government bureaucrat, even the, the odd university yeah. professor. Um, and um, uh, so um, I'm not sure, I hear what you're saying. Um, and I would agree that, you know, a better job can always be done, but I'm not exactly sure how to, how to uh, insert this so-called uh, preference for, for commercial fishing into the, uh, into the analysis, but it is an interesting perspective. Ralph? Since the, a big change has occurred in the last 25 years or so, has been increasingly increased charter fees or shipping and recreation. Mm, yes. And, and I think we all agree that's actually a good thing for the following reasons. That is, the marginal value of commercial fishery is easier to estimate. The marginal value can be revealed in the charter fishery. Whereas the recreational, for a lot of reasons, it's, it's actually hard to get good marginal estimates because you don't actually allocate the marginal fish. But my question is, is just deeply, and that is that for 25 or 30 years, obviously the charter fleet likes being treated like the recreational fleet. That's clear. But economists basically took that and said, yeah, we'll treat them as the recreational fleet and didn't object. Economists were not, in my mind, for this period, out there saying it's a mistake to treat the charter fleet fleet, clearly there ought to be three allocations here, that there's no reason not to separate these out. And I think we are, we are doing that increasingly now, but thinking back to the period you're talking about, you know, you could accuse economists of being complicit in that recreational uh, accumulation. Yeah, I would say it was probably an oversight. Uh, I mentioned earlier I was in, in doing a um, <coughs> presentation to Gulf of Mexico types, and uh, there's a huge uh, charter uh, fleet in uh, Louisiana, Texas, and whatever. And so there was a division between commercial and recreational for uh, 
uh, grouper and whatever, and it was roughly 50-50. But what was happening was the charter fleet was used to uh, working 250 d days a year, but then the so-called private fleet was taking more and more, and they hit the recreational limit, and they had to shut down after 60 days or so. Which And they had all kinds of ways of continuing with 250 days season with a lower take per charter vessel um, through in-house regulations and practices, but it, it wouldn't provide any benefit to them, okay? So, yeah, I would agree this whole issue, and this is obviously an issue in uh, Southeast Alaska with Halbert and, and, uh, and other things. And uh, um, just in commercial, you, you talk about sane versus gonad versus coal, you know, divvying up a you know, particular salmon species. This is the analog, but as you said, it's, it's many de decades uh, coming to, uh, to be top of mind. Magnus and Stevens Act, I'm not, uh, I, tr I try to uh, keep my contact with legalese as, uh, as limited <laughs> as possible. Uh, I'm not sure if it, if it does, I mean, or I haven't seen, you know, somebody citing this as a, as a passage that solves our problem. I mean, it would be up, up a flagpole by now, I think, if it existed somewhere in there, but uh, I must admit I'm not really familiar with In an economic context, how, how do you separate the values for different species? I mean, one of the things that this gentleman brought up yeah. was sockeye salmon in Cook Inlet yeah. in the late 1990s, and it's not, in Cook Inlet, it's not just merely a matter of sockeye salmon, commercial versus recreational, it's the fact that commercial guys also harvest Chinook salmon, which are highly valued by recreational fishermen, and you have people in the Kenai River that on Tuesday may be standing on a shore fishing for sockeye salmon, and the next day they're on a charter boat for Chinook salmon. Uh, how, do you, how do you separate those things out? Uh, well, on the commercial side, as usual, it, things are much easier because it, you know, it comes from the fish, the separate landing statistics, separate wholesale values. On the recreational side, and Gunnar Knapp uh, and I are going through this exercise right now, we're doing, uh, looking at economic impacts of um, of salmon in general from southeast all the way down to Oregon and uh, uh, for the Pacific Salmon Commission and both recreational and commercial. And one of the challenges on, on the recreational side, uh, we, and I see this uh, fairly often, people will take total recreational expenditures. They're talking about one particular species, so they'll allocate all recreational expenditures for all species to, to the policy issue at hand, which is on one species. So one of the challenges on the recreational side is how do you, how do you allocate these anger days and these anger expenditures to particular species? And again, that's more art than uh, uh, than science. And there is uh, on the you know the charter folks in uh, in uh, Southeast they have to fill in a logbook and whatever. And there is a question there about whether they're directing uh, their uh, their clients' effort at salmon versus bottom fish, including halibut. So there is some snippets of information, but but it is important, very important, in fact, to to allocate. You know, in theory, if you if you looked at all these species as, a, as a, uh, individually, they should all, you should be able to add them all up and get the total anger days and the total anger efforts. And that it's not exactly clear that you know all analysis are are like that. Yeah, but it doesn't have anger effort. I mean, I, I've well, been talking it to those people. Have, it doesn't have catch anything. It doesn't have anything. No, it has the catches, but it doesn't have. Right. It doesn't have the anger effort. It doesn't have the effort if you don't catch anything. No, no, it doesn't have the effort directed at salmon versus halibut versus whatever. Well, it, it does in the sense that you can catch all of the harvest. It's not a question that, no, the heart, it's not a question that they ask. What, what are you fishing for? No, they, they don't. They just said, what is the catch? Yeah, yeah. So, so catch, you know, you don't catch anything. 
But if you catch snook and halibut, how do you divide? You know. Yeah, if it's the same day. Yeah, then you can't divide. So that, I'm not sure which one you think about how to do that. Yeah. Okay. Any case. On the commercial side, it doesn't matter whether it's directed or versus bycatch. As long as all that matters is whether it's retained and goes through the marketplace. That's not, ne that's not necessarily true because Chinook plays a bigger role than just catching Chinook and its and its wholesale value or whatever it is down the line. Is uh, it also serves as an input to the production process for catching uh, sockeye, right? So I mean, uh, you couldn't just say you can't catch Chinook and the cost of that is the foregone Chinook that you can no longer catch because you can't catch sockeye without catching Chinook. Yeah, well, well on the cost side, not, for, for these vessels catching, more, allocating the cost between various species is a challenge on the commercial side, I would agree. Everything's a challenge on, on, the, on, the, commercial, uh, on, the, on the fishery side uh, from a data point of view. So. So in, in British Columbia, then, and most of the work that you've done on, the allocation yeah. is this group gets to kill X number of fish and this group gets to kill X number of fish? Well, on, hal on halibut, that's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Salmon, because there aren't formal TACs set before the season, it's, it's based on in-season management or whatever. There aren't a TAC as opposed to so many numbers of fish that each side is, is allowed to catch, and that's why there's raise priority access has, has come into play. Uh, on these other, on, um, on how, but there is a formal number, and in fact, you know, where this allocation has been settled, including Gulf of uh, Mexico, you know, there are formal numbers that add to 100%. Yeah, Mike, can quieter than, than a room of fishermen and, and an anger, so, okay, that's it. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.